Rick, you yourself received um, an award for editorial writing. Now, this was a series of editorials that you wrote related to the General Assembly session. Tell us about the pieces. What I wanted to do was find some of the columns that I'd written over the over the previous year that dealt with some issues that had not been uh, getting a lot of coverage in the traditional press or in the mainstream press. And so I packaged them as, uh, as sort of underappreciated stories from the recent legislative session. So that included uh, editorials about the fact that we ha- had gotten through another budget cycle without any serious drama, that we'd, they'd actually been able to cut taxes and uh, increase savings and still uh, get some spending uh, increases in there as well. And that really didn't get a lot of attention in the other press. And so that was one of the stories. Another one uh, had to do with the uh, absence of unaffiliated uh, members of the state board of elections. Now, that subsequently may change depending on what the law does. But there were Democrats who were complaining that although unaffiliated voters are becoming uh, or had become the second highest category or classification of voters in North Carolina, they had no representation on the State Board of Elections. And my basic point was there was no way to do that because the General Assembly had allocated a slot for unaffiliated candidates. And besides that, there's not an unaffiliated party of North Carolina. I mean, there's not, you know, there's not an, or an independent uh, party as such on the ballot. And so there are sort of issues that I discussed that may not have gotten much attention. And um, the, uh, the, actually, the, the executive, or excuse me, the president of the Press Association sent me a personal note saying that, that he read all the entries. Uh, And he thought that my editorials really were stellar. So I was glad to see that. Rick, what I think is really important for our listeners to understand about you winning this award is not only is it just terrific that, you know, you've won the award and the Carolina Journal has been honored in this category for editorial writing, but it really speaks to the niche that Carolina Journal really fills in terms of covering things that other um, media members, newspapers, radio, television don't cover. Right. That's right. We don't try to be and don't pretend to be the newspaper of record, the thing that you have to pick up if you want to know everything that's going on in state government in North Carolina. But we want to cover issues that we think are very important to our audience and that should be covered. And so that's why we will deal with uh, education policy from perhaps a different perspective than other places. We might talk more about property rights or open government transparency issues and things like that. And so we're not going to try to cover every legislative hearing, but we're going to try to make sure that issues that are relevant to limited government uh, and, uh, and individual freedom freedom uh, get coverage that uh, may not otherwise get uh, paid attention to by the other media outlets in the state. Let's talk about the uh, two other awards. This time, uh, both of them won by associate editor Carrie Travis, an up-and-coming journalist in this area. I'm really proud to have her working here at Carolina Journal. Let's talk first about her series on juvenile justice reform, Mm -hmm. Raise the Age specifically. What was that about, Rick? Those were about efforts in the General Assembly to change the way that uh, young offenders are, are prosecuted and handled by the justice system. And North Carolina wound up being the last state in the nation that still treated uh, people who were younger than 18 as, uh, as adults in many cases. And this process cha- raised the age of prosecution in the uh, juvenile system from 16 to 18. And so what it simply did was phased in this process so that uh, people who were younger than 18 many of the males were not treat, just simply warehoused in the adult system or handled by juvenile courts in which typically they get more counseling. There's a much more uh, rehabilitative effort to, uh, to, to handle these young people and to give them opportunities to, uh, once they have paid their debts to society, to actually reintegrate in a normal society and not just simply be you know, dumped out, as they say, dumped out in the Walmart parking lot and be left on their own. This had become an issue for um, state lawmakers because they were looking at research that was showing that reform of this kind in other states had had really had some sort of an impact or a correlation mm-hmm. with recidivism. And of course, right. the goal of any system would be to, if someone's going to be back out in society, you want them to become productive, law-abiding members of society. You right. don't want them to reoffend. Right. And and we had just been laggards in that issue. And uh, people at the John Locke Foundation uh, had made a, an ish, a, big, a big effort in the regards of research and to talk about the fact that other states that had great success. And then the, the main issue at that point then was convincing uh, members of the General Assembly and the public at large that it was worth the additional expense to move these categories of offenses from adult offenses to juvenile offenses for older offenders. And uh, to, to point out, if you will, 
that the initial investment, because it requires an initial investment not only in different sorts of facilities, but also an investment in more people to serve as counselors and to serve as mentors, sometimes to serve as judges, and, uh, and to actually adjudicate these cases, that that upfront cost was worthwhile. And we were very happy to see that uh, that, that had an impact, because it's one thing when uh, you know the American Civil Liberties Union or some group that's normally associated with the left comes out and says we need to handle uh, criminal offenders differently if they're basically engaged in nonviolent offenses. But it's another thing entirely for a group that's more con uh, affiliated or aligned with conservative to say the same thing. Rick, um, Carrie Travis's second award for reporting um, came for a, a series of pieces she wrote about a really terrible problem in North Carolina and other states, and that is human trafficking. Right. She uh, she won that award, and we're very happy again about that, about that uh, recognition and acknowledgement, because the, the most people have associated the issue of human trafficking with immigration and illegal immigration, and what uh, you would hear about the you know the van load of uh, you know twenty Salvadoran immigrants who were being used essentially uh, brought uh, over the across the border to serve as cheap labor or day labor for different uh, facilities, different you know construction sites, that sort of thing. She focused on the sex trade and the fact that there are. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of victims that North Carolina is one of the real hotbeds nationally for the sex trade and for uh, mo mostly women who are abducted against their will or who quite often are becoming involved in abusive relationships and then are used uh, for prostitution, for drug trafficking, for other sorts of, of, of purposes. And, and she, um, she did a very good job of actually finding organizations that were trying to help these women and pointing out the fact that that was very that had a big impression on the legislature that there's the problem is that you can rescue these women from this life but then what happens this is sort of like the juvenile offender issue then what what do you do how do you provide them with education and training how do you give them a place to live what sorts of things happen and right now state law did not allow uh, state funding to go to an awful lot of these nonprofit organizations and so this is something the general assembly is still dealing with but it we we raised the attention on it, and she got an incredible amount of compliments from the members of the General Assembly about that. Rick, we're living in a time when there is a lot of criticism from left, center, and right about journalism, uh, journalists, and uh, the reporting these days. Some people have even said that, well, journalism is either dying or is dead very much alive and well at Carolina Journal. Well, yes, it is. And the thing is, journalism is not dead. The demand for information is not dead. The problem is figuring out how to pay for it. And the model that we have embraced is one in which the people who are the consumers of our journalism, we hope, will support us in that regard. And so uh, we're not, we don't get it, uh, a huge amount of money, in fact, a very small amount of money from advertising. We certainly don't get it from circulation because we don't charge for Carolina Journal. So we get it from uh, the uh, the goodwill of people who support our mission and, and hope that we succeed at it. If you would like to read these award-winning stories from Carolina Journal's Rick Henderson and Carrie Travis, they are online where they were published at carolinajournal.com. If you go to the website and go into the search box and just put in North Carolina Press Association, then that series of stories is going to pop up for you right there. Rick Henderson is editor-in-chief. Rick, thank you very much. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you very much.